Hello, Alon. <laughs> All right. Well, while um, while everyone's joining, I might just um, get started and and welcome you all. Thank you all for for um, coming along to this Sensi Lab forum. Um, for anyone who's joining for the first time, uh, Sensi Lab is an arts and technology research laboratory based at Monash University in Australia, and um, these forums are a regular event for us, um, and we use them as a showcase for creators and researchers who are. Uh, exploring the undiscovered creative applications of technology, which is what Sensi Labs all about. Um, so, a little bit of um, a bit of, bit of housekeeping, I suppose, at the at the outset before I welcome Louise. Um, this forum is being recorded, and we'll make it available on the Sensi Lab website um, after the event today. Um, Louise is going to be giving a presentation and then we will have time for some questions at the end. So, because this is a webinar format. Um, I think what would be the best to do is to write your questions in the chat and we'll kind of have a dedicated section at the end um, when Louise will be taking the questions. So just kind of um, pop them in as you think of them as you speak in. Um, so today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Louise Devonish. Um, Louise is a contemporary percussionist uh, whose creative practice blends performance, collaboration and artistic research. Um, she's a senior research fellow, an honours coordinator and percussion coordinator here at Monash and she's also a Churchill Fellow. And she's recently published her first book, Global Percussion Innovations and Australian Perspectives. So congratulations, Louise, on, um, on doing all of that and on publishing. Um, and thank you for joining us today. It's really a thrill to have you here. And, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing how, how your practice is going, especially under the current conditions. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so I will hand over to you. Um, and yes, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Cool. Thanks very much, Katie and John, for inviting me uh, to be here at the Sensi Lab Forum today. It's really nice to be um, meeting and speaking with some other new colleagues at Monash. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge that this Zoom webinar is on is being hosted, I suppose, on land owned by the traditional owners of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, as Katie has already said. Um, I am new to Monash this year. I'm working in the School of Music. I work primarily in contemporary music um, and I'm establishing a new percussion studio in the department, but my role is primarily in research. Um, I've only met a couple of Sensi Lab folks so far, uh, literally two, Katie and John. So I'm thinking of this forum as a, a general introduction to my work. Um, so over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to give a, a brief intro to my general areas of research interests. I'm going to share some information about some previous projects from the past few years that have led to the work that I'm doing now, and then talk a little bit about some of the artistic research projects that are forming uh, some of my DECRA research at Monash. And yeah, questions and conversation after that I look forward to. Uh, so hopefully I've shared my screen and you can see what I hope you can see my slides. Can everybody see those? Katie, can, are they coming through okay? Yeah, I can see them, so I think everyone will be able to see them. Okay, thanks for that confirmation, I appreciate it. Uh, okay, so this slide is just a bit of a summary to my research interests. So as a performer, I work mainly with um, contemporary chamber music ensembles, including Decibel New Music, which some of you may be familiar with because some of the other members are at Monash. Um, I do a lot of collaborative projects um, and they're often connected with performance but my artistic research practice goes beyond performance including writing and, and teaching and recently I've adopted the term artist scholar to de describe these different facets of my work. Um, so percussion and collaboration are really at the centre of what I do and I, I think about them in this way. So I think of percussion as being my tools of trade if you like and collaboration as being my method. And my artistic research areas of interest are listed here on the slide in, in white. So obviously performance, Australian music is in there. Um, also instrumentality, notation and gender and music are some areas of interest for me. And all of the projects that I am involved with tend to connect three or four of these areas at once. So there's, um, yeah, different things all intersect that way. Um, I'd like to start by just playing a little bit of music. I'm going to play a short excerpt from uh, a project that uh, was significant for me and then I'll, I'll speak a little bit about it. Uh, some of you might have come across this before, so this is just about a minute of video. <laughs> Thank you. 
So even though I've been making music for a while now, um, this project, Music for Percussion and Electronics, was really one of the first solo projects I made that really felt like me. And it's been a starting point for a number of more recent works and some recurring themes of exploration, uh, one of which has been the integration of electronics with acoustic percussion instruments. So in this particular project, each work uh, focuses on a single metal percussion instrument with a different form of electronic treatment. And um, these works were taken from different recitals over a period of a couple of years, um, recorded into a studio album, and then the album was kind of reverse engineered into a new solo show um, and it had the addition of some generative video projections designed by my friend Ross Carr which hopefully you could see in the video there so a lot of those uh, the projections were linked with the um, electronic and acoustic audio and uh, changed over the course of the, the performance. Um, a second there are three works that I'd like to just talk about as being kind of significant and leading to where I am now. The second one is Never Tilt Your Chair um, so I'll just play a little bit of an excerpt from that one as well. Oh, it looks like it's having a bit of trouble there. I'll give it another go. So these, these uh, little excerpt videos are available on YouTube and what I might do is share these links with Katie to distribute to people after the presentation if you want to have a, a bit of a look at them because I'm not sure if there's a bit of, bit of grief uh, in terms of them getting to you right now. But um, this work, Never Tilt Your Chair, was composed by Kate Neal uh, for my group The Sound Collectors and it was part of a show representative of uh, current explorations in instrumental theatre and instrumentality. So Never Tilt Your Chair it uses the history of Western dining table etiquette as a point of departure for the instrumentation, for the performance practices and the compositional material. And its title is taken from a book called uh, Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, which was originally published in 18, 1861. And this was a book that was uh, designed for the newly married woman to be able to keep house with confidence. It was um, a domestic text, but it's still in print today, even though it has been substantially modified. Um, what I, I really like about this work and why it was uh, kind of pivotal for me, pivot, there's that word of 2020, sorry everyone, um, is that the source material in this, in this work, uh, the cutlery, uh, was sometimes an instrument, it was sometimes used as a set, uh, and at other times in the work it was used as a mallet. So these materials were being used in multiple different ways in performance. Um, when it was acting as an instrument, uh, it was in those racks of cutlery that, that you heard just then. Uh, the cutlery there was arranged by type and pitch set and the three racks covered nearly five octaves. Um, when it was being used as a set, uh, it took the form of that motorised chandelier at the beginning of that, that clip. Uh, and also the racks formed uh, almost like walls of a dining room. Uh, and when the cutlery was being used as a mallet, um, it was used to sound other uh, pieces of diningware or cutlery. And so, for example, in another part of the work, 
there's a set of very sharp serrated knives which are used uh, to be dragged on the edge of a set of glass dessert compotes uh, to create this shimmering buzz rolly type sound and this was a technique very particular to those knives and those compotes and this sort of set me on a bit of a trajectory of exploring some you know unique sounds and uh, potential of different objects of instruments. Um, interestingly, this project by default of coincidentally being an all-female artistic team um, and it being about a juxtaposition of uh, public behaviour and private domestic etiquette, it ended up facilitating a number of discussions around music and, and gender and one of my at-home during lockdown projects has been um, co-authoring an article uh, using this work as a case study uh, and that article is in the final stages of re review now it's called uh, Trans Transgressing Domesticity in Never Tilt Your Chair. Uh, the third sort of preliminary work that I'd just like to mention is from last year. This is um, uh, for, uh, this, this work is one of three in a wider project uh, called Sheets of Sound. Uh, and the idea with the Sheets of Sound project was to make works that sat somewhere between concert performance work and installation piece. And this particular piece permeating through the pores of shifty planes, shifting planes um, explored the instrumentality of surfaces and surface materials. So materials that didn't have a resonating body or resonating chamber attached to them. And these surface materials had their sound world extended uh, using electronics. So I'll just play a bit of this one now. That video is quite, I don't know, dark and moody, <laughs> but what was happening there, there were some sheets of uh, aluminium, sheets of uh, silver acetate and sheets of tracing paper. Uh, and I had very small uh, microphones on my wrist that enabled us to pick up different frequencies and these materials that um, are not heard necessarily from, from a distance. And then and this material was captured and then used uh, as part of a Max MSP patch for the electronics there that Annie operated in performance. Um, also in the same project uh, was another piece by a local Melbourneian, my friend Matthias Schacharnet. Um, this work, Catacomb Body Double, uh, was also in the Sheets of Sound program. And in this piece, it's, I think it's interesting because uh, the setup looks like it's all about a couple of bass drums. Um, but in this work, they're never struck. So they're used, they're activated using um, a pair of transducers, large butt kickers, which are attached to the underside of the bass drum. Uh, and when these butt kickers are activated, uh, it transforms the bass drum and the bass drum skin into a vibrational surface, which is used to activate other instruments rather than being struck as an instrument itself. So uh, that's another uh, interesting area of practice for me, I think, this use of instruments in uh, other ways. <laughs> Um, great, so those three pro uh, projects uh, really set the scene for my more recent work, which centres around instrumentality and performance practice and the transferal of percussive techniques to different materials. 
Um, and this really informed my DECRA proposal. So in February, I started a new role at Monash. I was previously based in Perth at the Uni of WA there. And I came to Monash primarily to work on this DECRA project titled The Role of Post-Instrumental Practice in New Music. Um, and this term post-instrumental was being thrown around a bit at the time of writing the grant application. Um, and it's interesting to me because it, it's good for describing certain things that are going on in contemporary music at the moment. And it's being used by some practitioners around the world, but it's not being used consistently. And part of this project is trying to understand uh, what people mean when they're talking about post-instrumental practice, particularly in comparison to a number of other terms des describing similar or overlapping themes of practice that are floating around in, in music. And the reason that I, I want to understand this term is really about understanding the practice and the music that it relates to. So understanding the activity using the word, if that makes sense. Uh, so some of the themes of practice are present in work that this term post-instrumental is applied to. It includes works that um, are interdisciplinary or multisensorial, uh, including using unique musical instruments that are purpose-built for uh, specific works to explore particular sonic ideas. Um, it applies to works that are really about making the ordinary something extraordinary by using familiar objects or common experiences as musical systems. Um, these, these works often use instruments that serve multiple artistic purposes, so instruments that might also be uh, infrastructure or notation in some cases, the instrument and the notation are the same thing. Um, and also a lot of these works are pieces that require a new type of virtuosity in their performance with a specific uh, type of performance practice that's more about the transferal of techniques across materials than uh, traditional notions of virtuosity that, um, that most of us are kind of brought up on. And um, so this is another notion that I'm quite interested in, in delving into too further, particularly because I'm coming at this topic from a performer, performance perspective. So asking, you know, what, what virtuosity is in this new music um, and understanding uh, different ways of thinking about it. So the aims of the, uh, the DECRA project are really to document and uh, analyse and understand some of the approaches to post-instrumental practice that are happening around the world, uh, and then to engage these practices in the development of new, um, I guess, conceptual frameworks by making new musical works of art. And the idea is to, to trace this practice um, using some existing works as case studies, uh, but primarily to apply these to new solo and ensemble works that, that feature percussion. So these new works, the creative components, if you like, of my DECRA project are housed in the Sound Collectors Lab. Um, so the Sound Collectors uh, was a, a group or a project that I established back in 2012 that has evolved into the Sound Collectors Lab in 2020. Um, and I'm describing this as a it's, a, it's a modular studio lab that's really dedicated to the research, development and creation of new music that really focuses or has a strong link with percussive practice. Um, so whereas the Sound Collectors uh, was originally a fixed group of performers and was really about making concerts, the lab expands beyond that to a wider group of creative collaborators, including artists and academics um, who are interested in interdisciplinary research-based artistic practice across composition, performance, sound design, industrial design, um, and the visual arts. Um, so over the next few years within this Sound Collectors Lab, there are two main streams of activity. Uh, the first is a suite of five creative works for percussion and electronics. Uh, and the second is a collection of new repertoire for percussion and piano by Australian composers that I'm developing with another new colleague in the School of Music who you should all meet, uh, Aura Go, who's a pianist. So I'd like to talk now a little bit about the first of the five uh, solo works, which are at the core of my DECRA project. Um, and this is the one that happily has managed to move forward a little bit under lockdown because my collaborators on this one are in Perth and <laughs> they've got fewer restrictions than we do. So this project is called Alluvial Gold and the focus of this project is the history of Australian shellfish reefs in metropolitan rivers. And the idea is uh, that we want to offer a new way to engage with and experience and understand the bodies of water around our cities. 
Um, the removal of shellfish reefs, native shellfish reefs, has impacted river systems uh, across southern and eastern Australia, including rivers in Victoria, the Birrung, uh, Double Yarragan in WA, rivers in Tasmania and South Australia as well. Um, and what happened, what the part of the history here is that during settlement, the native shellfish reefs in these river systems were very heavily dredged and ground up to use as a source of lime for mortar and roads and other building materials at over 150 sites across Australian cities. So in WA, um, these original reefs don't exist anymore. Uh, but the river there, I, I was at this river basically every day. My university was right on the river there and I ate my lunch down there and look at this river, but didn't really know, uh, know what was going on beneath the surface and know the history. Um, and so there's no, uh, none of these shellfish reefs left in WA, but in some river systems, there are traces of them. And would you believe in that huge storm last week, you know, when the wind was kind of whipping the bay up, um, I went down there for, for a walk and I came across actually some, um, they've come apart now, but pairs of oyster shells which are kind of like a miniature version of, of some of these um, original uh, shells and oyster shells. So the original uh, ones that have been discovered fossilised are more uh, like dinner plate size, like they're very, very large. Um, so a different a different type of uh, oyster shell that we're more familiar with. So the creative team for this project is uh, me and visual artist Erin Coates and composer and sound designer Stuart James. And our approach with this project has really been focused around, um, we really wanted to build this work with a non-discipline dominant order of creation. So while we've worked together before, it's it's really more been in a sense of, okay, Erin has a video and we need to then make the sound for that retrospectively. Or in making music works, you might have a projection design made after the music has, has been created. But we wanted to do this in, in parallel and really inform each other's practice and approach. So what we've ended up with this project, Alluvia Gold, is that it, it's designed to exist as both an art installation, which will run for a few months early next year, and a music performance. There'll be a season of performance. And, and this the project includes a series of components, including one which you can see in progress here is a giant oyster shell curtain. Um, so, which is going to be absolutely huge. And this, this oyster shell curtain um, will have electronics weaved into it so uh, and sensors, so we can put, play around with that in a performance capacity as well. The, the curtain is going to be suspended from the ceiling of the space, but a big uh, arm of it is going to wrap around and engulf some other percussion instruments too. Um, so the, cur the curtain is a big part. Uh, there's also a range of sculptural percussion instruments whose design is really informed by what we find in the river and river ecology. So uh, some of these instruments are made of ceramics, like the ones uh, which this is before they were fired. Um, these in this uh, image here, you can see some uh, sculptural ceramic instruments that are based on the oyster shells. They can hold water, um, they can be sounded internally uh, where there's a, a much more smooth surface and externally it's a much more highly textured surface for a, um, a different uh, sound world there. Um, some of the other sculptural percussion instruments are cast metal, so there are some bronze cast metal uh, dolphin bones, so um, wax moulds. Erin uh, made some wax moulds of some dolphin bones and they've uh, then been cast in bronze. And these sculptural instruments will be um, used to expand the range of existing percussion instruments. So to expand out a vibraphone with these microtonal bronze bones and ceramic, ceramic instruments. Uh, there's also a whole lot of um, recordings, so hydrophone recordings, audio recordings and video that Erin's um, been making underwater. Uh, and this video will exist in two components, one that will run during the exhibition ongoingly um, and then components of that video are being taken out and put together in a different projection mapping design that will be um, yeah, projected onto all of the instruments in the performance. So I've got a brief bit of um, video, 90 seconds, uh, to show you uh, a little bit of what this looks like and sounds like. And would you believe this audio was made at home <laughs> during lockdown with the material that I have here.
Okay, cool. All right. Um, so that's a little bit about alluvial gold, which is the first of these five five works. Uh, the others uh, have been a little bit stranded by COVID nineteen, unsurprisingly. Um, but each of the other projects, uh, it has each one has an entirely different creative team, and in each team, there's at least one person that I've worked with closely before, usually the composer, as it was in this case with Stuart, and at least one person who's a completely new collaborator. So that's that's quite exciting for me. So while these other projects have been kind of slowed down by restrictions, um, I've been working on some other, um, not smaller, necessarily smaller projects, but some other projects which I've kind of nicknamed, uh, I guess, my pivot projects as a way to take control of that, that word. <laughs> um, and the, the, the main one, the really, the really big one, I suppose, is one with Decibel New Music, which is uh, the ensemble I mentioned earlier, directed by Professor Kat Hope, who I think is in the Zoom room today. Um, so currently three members of Decibel are based at Monash, the other three are in WA. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the group, um, Decibel was originally conceived by Kat as a research ensemble to explore the integration of acoustic instruments and electronic instruments and the interpretation and realisation of graphic notations and, and digital notations. So a lot of the work, or all of the work that uh, Decibel does, uh, uses an app called the Decibel Score Player, which is an iPad app for reading animated graphic scores in either scrolling, slide, or talking board formats. And the, the Decibel Pandemic Project uh, is called Two Minutes From Home. Uh, and this is a project that commissions 22 minute pieces for online release throughout 2020. And the works are released fortnightly on social media, um, showing the six musicians in the ensemble performing an animated score in the score player. Um, so the composers in the group are, um, uh, the composers who we've uh, engaged for this project are all people that the ensemble had worked with before. So there was some existing um, collaborative understanding to, to draw on as we were making all of these works in, in isolation. Um, and it's been a really exciting project actually to be involved in as, and has proved um, resistant to the yo-yoing of, of lockdown and the different situations for different people in different cities. So I think we've done about seven works so far. Um, number eight is a percussion solo that requires a bass drum that's somewhere on the border between Queensland and New South Wales at the moment. So we're moving on to number nine and ten before that. And the first the first one we did was a piece that I made called Tort, which you can see a still of on the screen here. Um, so Tort was made on the 28th of March um, and this piece was a percussive representation of the daily news cycle, the daily cycle of information that was surrounding COVID-19 in those early stages, um, when we were getting, you know, lots of messages from news apps, lots on social media, and I was finding that information in different communities and in different time zones were often out of sync with each other and sometimes contradictory, and it was just kind of this barrage of information which it, it felt like a polyrhythm of information to me. So, um, taught was based on that uh, idea and was just composed for ceramic bowls because that was the one thing I knew everyone would have at, at home, even though they might not have had access to other, other instruments. Um, just have an image here of uh, another work in the series. The video here is by, um, design is by Carl Ockleford, and this work was by Lionel Marchetti, a work called La Patience, so a completely different uh, score format than the one that, that I used. Um, a couple of other pivot projects that um, you might like to look out for that are coming up soon. Um, I have one called uh, Digital Phasing, which is uh, a work that is for nine distributed performers, each in a different city. So there are three in Southeast Asia, three in Australia, three in New Zealand, um, online performing this, this work, which has been designed in response or in acknowledgement of the 50th anniversary of Steve Reich's drumming from 1971. Um, and will be included as part of a big online project celebrating this work. And the main premise behind this piece is to use the latency that Zoom um, contributes to any uh, online music experiences, to use this latency as a, a way to um, phase. It's a, a sort of you know, restriction, lockdown uh, response to some of these phasing models. Um, and so this is for glockenspiels uh, primarily and other instruments that everybody has at home. So that's that's coming up in November. Um, over the last few months, I've also done a series of 
digital digital duos. So some of these are projects where I've just been improvising or performing with someone else on their project, and others have been projects uh, instigated or directed by me. Um, they've been put out variously as Bandcamp albums. Um, one has been uh, is going to be premiered soon on the eighth of September. There was a, there's a watch party around that. Um, and another coming out in an, an e-zine, and I've got uh, some images of one of these. Oops, one of these works there. Um, so this is a, a piece uh, for two glockenspiels and animation. It's been animated for this this performance. Um, all of these digital duos ended up being inspiration for one of the other uh, five sort of main decra projects for me when I was thinking, okay, how can I keep moving forward with these projects when you know, the residencies that they were supposed to take place in aren't there. Um, so this digital duos project informed uh, a project that still has a working title, uh, which is a remote collaboration between two teams of composers and performers, uh, one team here in Melbourne and one team in Freiburg in Germany, um, where we're going to be developing a series of three new works and using uh, various online platforms, we're going to be, um, I guess, exchanging information on a number of different uh, levels. So as a performer, a lot of the collaborations I do tend to be a performer composer kind of collaboration, but I'm quite interested in making you work with performer to performer uh, communication and also composer to composer uh, communication. And so uh, this, this approach has been taken with, with this project. So that'll be some for new works in, in 2021. Um, so yeah, that's probably a good time to stop. I'm aware it's 4.36 already, so I might leave it there for the, for the moment. And if people would like to start asking questions or um, com start a conversation, maybe now's a good time for that, Katie. Yeah, that's, a great, that's a great time. We've got, um, we've got one questions come through and I've got a few notes as well. So while everyone else is, um, is thinking of their questions, um, I just, I will actually say, Maybe if you want to, um, if you want me to activate mics as well, um, you can either just send me a message if you prefer to ask a question rather than chatting it. You can, um, you can, you can actually talk, but I'll need to just give you access. So, chat me in the in the chat and tell me that you want to do that, or um, just raise your hand and I'll I'll activate your mic. Um, but we've got a question from Oscar, so maybe we'll go to that first. And he's asking, um, Hi Louise, are there any natural timbers that you would identify as preeminently Victorian? Um, for example, winds through a particular gum tree, waves crashing in one particular beach. If so, what would be the defining sonic feature? What's the sound effect, um, Maria? <laughs> yeah, right in there, Oscar. Thank, thanks very much for your question. Uh, I think the short answer would be no. Um, not sounds that are particularly Victorian. I think one of the interesting things about percussion practice, um, which I've, I'm obviously heavily involved in, is that our, our art form really hit its stride and was evolving at a time when globalization was really a thing as well. So um, there's a lot of cross-pollination uh, in between different practices that use these instruments and approaches, I, I think, uh, in a way maybe uh, that there wasn't when the oboe was being developed a couple of hundred years ago um, and other instruments like that. So I wouldn't say there are instruments that are particularly Victorian. There are um, instruments that are, have particularly Australian sounds, but I don't not not that I know of any restricted to Victoria. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you um, a couple of things about. I mean. Going back to one of the things you were just recently talking about, your online duos and one of your pivot projects, um, I wanted to know a bit more about the, the how you are finding the process of, of creating these online collaborations. And are you doing anything live? Um, are you are you composing by Zoom? I want to know what the what that's like for you and how it's affecting your practice. Yeah. Oh, it's it's um it's not like a way I've worked ever before. So I'm very much a person that likes to be in other people uh, together in a room doing lots of things. So I've had to completely uh, re attempt <laughs> uh, everything that I'm doing. So at the beginning of all this, like every artist everywhere, there was a process of dismantling, planning again, uh, and then dismantling again of, of projects and approaches. And that was pretty stressful for a while there until it, we realized, I think, that it was something that was going to be here for a while. So, okay, let's just find a new a new way in. So, um, it it hasn't it wasn't a quick thing for me. Like, I wasn't immediately like, okay, no worries, I'm just going to do this online and make this project. It's something that's happened quite 
quite slowly and really being dependent on um, who I've been in touch with and, and what we kind of come up with together. So um, organising online performances and creating work specifically using things like Zoom is not something that I've directly done before. I've performed in telematic performances um, and done a few, you know, various things online, but not quite in this in this way. So it's completely changed things. And as far as the... Um, you know, the works that will ultimately be for live performance, we've just had to really change the collaboration process. So like everyone, I think there's been a lot of video and audio recording, a lot more exchange of materials and individual work before we all come together. And more than a few times I thought, gee, I'm glad I grew up in Perth where we were so far away from everyone anyway, that these, this process of collaborating with composers and having, you know, sending them videos I've made on photo booth or whatever was not it wasn't new. I've done that, done that before, but but maybe not just quite as much. Um, Alon wanted me to um, to give him access to his mic, so maybe I'll ask Alon. Are you? Um... I've just written it down as well. But um, thanks for a great talk, Louise. Um, really awesome stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing those videos in in high quality. Um, yeah, I, I had a lot of questions, but one was how do you define virtuosity in instruments that no one else plays? Yeah, it's a really good question. I've actually been working on some writing about that today. So because I've been thinking about that quite a lot. So I think um, in a lot of our like, musical training, artistic training, we're kind of um, steeped in a particular type of virtuosity that's uh, often linked with uh, physicality, athleticism, um, lots of lots of notes a lot of speed and all of that kind of stuff so it's a very uh, a physical kind of kind of thing um, but a lot of the instruments that i like to use for example the sheet materials and sheets of sound they're really not designed to play fast licks and scales that's not why we're exploring them so i think um, in thinking about um, virtuosity in different ways maybe we just need to look at other types of virtuosity so maybe that's a virtuosity of of listening uh, maybe it's not related to physicality, it's not related to um, one's, you know, uh, athletic abilities, it's linked with other things. So um, I'm not explaining it very well at the moment, but I think there are many different types of virtuosity and there have been many types of virtuosity over many hundreds of years. Um, and a lot of the new music that's being made, particularly in fields like percussion or in electronic music, um, the new forms of music are requiring new performance practices and new skill sets that go in, in with that. And something I notice a lot in percussion is that we don't become um, virtuosi on a single instrument the way a viola player might become a, a virtuosi on the viola. What we become really skilled in is uh, the transferal of technique from one instrument, learned on one instrument, our, our virtuosity is in that transfer and application of that to other things in order to draw draw sound out of new materials and kind of find the sonic identity of whatever it is that you're exploring. So I think I think that's maybe a good way to think about it, this transferal of technique and a way of um, allowing different materials that perhaps weren't purpose built for musical use to speak sonically and musically. That's, that's great. Thanks. To, to me, part of what I saw in those videos is your virtuosity extended towards physical movement as well, which I really appreciate with watching a great percussionist. There's, it's not just the sound, it's the, the look is virtuosic, the, the way that everything's controlled to like, I don't know, such a high level, so, so much detail. To me, that's virtuosic as well. But um, yeah, love to discuss it further. Great, yep, sure thing, anytime. <laughs> Well, maybe that's a good um, that's a good segue to the next question, which is from John, um, who uh, has asked, can you talk a little bit about how you work with the visual components in your works? Are the visuals in a response to the sound or are they co-developed? Yeah, great. So I don't make the visuals myself. So I'm a, a big fan of um, DDIY, don't do it yourself, uh, because I'm not I'm not trained in that field. I don't I don't have those skills. My skill set is in the performance and in the instruments. And so when I'm working uh, on projects that have a visual component, I work, want to work with someone who's really going to focus in on on that um, on that side of things. So it's been different in different projects. In the ones that are like the music for percussion and electronics, that was um, actually that was my first remote project a couple of years ago, which came about remotely purely because of our 
uh, Ross's schedule in New York, my schedule in Perth, and how much time we'd lose if one of us flew back the other way. So we actually made those those projections were done entirely remotely using Google Chrome add-ons into a little theater at my last university, um, where I had the whole thing set up and multiple devices that would show the setup, but also me playing. And um, those uh, projections were uh, developed and used in performance in a software program called Isadora, which is designed specifically for projection in theater and performance. So you can quite easily map different layers of video onto different in my case, different instruments in different shapes and trigger them that way. You can um, preset them to uh, fixed electronic tracks or you can set up microphones so the visuals will um, change and respond to the material that's happening in live performance. So I, I maybe sound slightly expert in talking about it like that, but my, my skills there are really in talking about what I want it to look like and then actually triggering it in the performance. So the design is something that I work with others on. Um, and hey, if there's anyone in Sensi Lab that wants to explore this sort of stuff with me, that'd be great. I was kind of hoping to meet some people like that in this talk today. So, Alon's probably the guy you should be talking to. <laughs> um, I kind of wanted to follow up kind of with a sort of a follow-on question to that, which was about um, the, the kind of the process of developing these new instruments. Like they're quite beautiful objects, especially the kind of the sculptural instruments that you were showing. Um, how, like, are you co-designing, does, does, does the object come first? Does the sound come first? Is it together? Can you talk about the process of design? Yeah, great. So the concept comes first. So in Alluvial Gold, you know, the, the conceptual point of departure of the river has really informed some of the shapes and things that uh, that we wanted to explore. And it's definitely happened in tandem. So we've had a lot of conversations about the kinds of materials that will um, be likely to produce um, sonic results that can be used in performance. So we talked a lot about the materials and settled on ceramics and metal because uh, they're materials that I know we can get a range of sounds out of and will blend really nicely with the other existing percussion instruments that I wanted to use. So the materials came first. Um, and then Erin, uh, who's the visual artist, she it was, it was her idea with the bones. She's like, I'm really into these uh, dolphin sculptures. I want to use those. What do you think? So then we spoke about uh, how to uh, modify those so they could be cast in such a way that they could be used as percussion instruments. So some are hollow, some are solid. Uh, there are surfaces that are flat. There are surfaces that are textured. You know, we had to make sure that before they were cast, uh, we tested some that would have holes drilled in them so they could be hung up and suspended. Others will rest on uh, foam or small mounts or structures like that. So it's it's very much something that we've done together. I certainly didn't say, hey, Erin, can you make me this? And off we go. And she didn't say, hey, I've made this. How does it sound? It's, it's definitely something that we've talked about together and, and with Stuart, actually, who's composing the music for that too. Alon's got another question. Alon, do you want to just go for it? Uh, it's kind of a continuation of what you were saying there. Are these sculptures going to be uh, in an exhibition? And uh, will they be able to be played by the public? Because I've always wanted to hit things when I go to galleries and I something excites me about, about being allowed to. Yeah, so the works, they will be displayed in an exhibition that's running for three months at uh, it's a place called the Heathcote Cultural Precinct, which is actually situated right on the river uh, that the inspiration for the work is drawn from. So there will be a three month run of, of these materials being exhibited and we've actually um, we're making a double set. So there's a set that'll be for performance and there'll be a set that'll be in the exhibition just in case something breaks or something happens. But also because of this whole remote thing, we realized we needed to have two sets of stuff. So I could have one set here in Melbourne to work on and Stuart and Erin could have a set there that they could, they could work on at the same time and we could do our workshops fruitfully. Um, so we've got those two sets for that. In the performance, um, it'll be they'll be for me to sound in the performance. It won't be a participatory uh, performance event, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, I don't think the exhibition is going to be set up in a way that um, they're interactive objects. I think the magic is that they're in the exhibition, you enjoy their visual uh, presence and identity. And then their sonic identity is really revealed in the live performance. So it's uh, two ways of, of using and looking at these objects. All right, I think we, I'm just going to ask if anyone else has any further questions for Louise. 
Um, gone through the list. Let me just check that I haven't missed any. No worries. Um, if people think of questions later on, because that always happens to me when I watch someone's talk, I always think of the questions afterwards. Um, I've just put my email address on the screen here, so I'm really happy to hear from anyone, particularly while we're all at home. I like emails from people out there, so I know people out there. Um, and also this is uh, my website, which has got a little bit of uh, more information about some of these pieces. So feel free to reach out, reach out that way. Um, you know, if you, if you don't have a question just now. We'll, um, I'll get those, uh, the videos, the links to your videos as well from you, Louise, and we'll put them on our website. Um, and I think we've got the link to your own website on our Sense Up Forum page as well. So um, that's all for everyone to go back to and, um, and, um, and look through later. Um, John, as actually, yeah, we've got one more question coming through from John, um, who would like to know about potential collaborations at Sensi Lab. So obviously, we, we um, you know, we can't wait to all get back into the lab and to to talk about things that we could do together. Um, is your work? Are you kind of um, looking at new collaborations, and are you looking at exploring things that Sensi Lab would be involved in? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm very keen to uh, meet new people at Monash and in the surrounding, you know, Melbourne area to make projects. Um, I have got in the back of my mind a few things that I'd love to chat with people about Sensi Lab, and I think um, there will be some interesting uh, things to discuss with regard to digital performance models as these restrictions start to ease. So I'm not sure exactly who does what in Sensi Lab yet, but um, I'd be really happy to speak to anyone who. Um, is interested in any of those kind of uh, digital digital formats, projections in particular. Um, but yeah, any of those kind of conversations, I'm, I'm hoping to come to more of these forums myself and hear more about what you guys are doing uh, so I can um, come with more specifics. But I think Alon's got a few things in the pipeline for us to do as well. So if anyone else wants to join in, yeah, come hang out. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, as soon as we're all allowed back in, we'll um, definitely arrange a time to, <laughs> for a show and tell and um, a meet and greet. Um, I think if that's, if that's all the questions, we might, um, we might uh, end the recording for today. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, thank you so much, Louise, for showing us your work. Um, it's absolutely spectacular visually and, and orally. Um, so, yeah, I can't wait to, to actually have the opportunity to experience some of this in the format that it's meant to be experienced, I suppose, live. Um, but yeah, uh, we look forward to, to connecting again in the future. All right, um, I'm going to start with the <laughs> Yeah, thanks for your questions, everyone. Yeah.